when you see someone successful, you see what they're doing that makes them successful. And oftentimes it's something that has very high quality output. You can't make good artwork or you can't make a good social media video until you've made a lot of bad social media videos. And the first project that I sold for this one company, I sold it for a thousand dollars and it was like a one minute animation. It like took me a whole month to do. And so, <laughs> and then I turned around in the next month, I was like, yeah. all right, I need to figure out like how I can make this sustainable. So do you have days when you're like, you know what? I'm just not super amped up today. And if you do, what do you tell yourself? How do you feel? What, how do you process that? When I decided like, okay, this is gonna be my thing. This is like my lifeblood that's gonna allow me to not get a job at a marketing thing. I know how much of a blessing my career is and I overall really enjoy a lot of things about what I do that make it worthwhile. Being a perfectionist is gonna be your downfall if you're trying to turn your passion or whatever it is into a social media thing or a full-time freelance thing. And so although it, all my stuff looks pretty polished, it still has that same mindset, this scrappy mentality of like, I'm gonna get it out the door, whether or not it's something that I'm super passionate about in the moment. I'm excited to talk to you, Jake, because you have posted some serious numbers on your social media platforms. You're smashing, you're crushing it, and you're so, so young. I'm very impressed by everything that you've done. The other thing that I'm really impressed by and something that I want to champion is that, as I understand it, you start out your journey to build a portfolio to get work. But now creating content is your primary source of income. So you're now fully part of this whole creator economy. You no longer have a boss. You're self-directed. You're an artist. And hats off to you. So in case people don't know who you are, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are? Yeah, so um, I'm a 3D artist is the easiest way to kick it off. And like you said, I am a full-time social media person now. I got my start doing 3D art as a freelance gig a couple years back. And as my social media started taking off, I switched over to doing social media full-time. So now I'm sitting at around 10 million on YouTube and 11 million on TikTok. But both of those figures have really come about in the past year. And so it's like, I've only been doing social media full-time for one year. And looking back, I mean, if we go back to January last year, I was maybe around 1 million on YouTube or 2 million. But if you go back even just two months earlier, I was at like 10,000 subscribers only. And so it's really been like a 15th month journey to get me to this spot. And so it's been a rocket ship of a ride. Wow. Okay. So I was really happy when we were posting like 30, 40,000 new subs a month. I'm like, this is freaking incredible. And you're up there in the hundreds of thousands, also a million subs a month. And it's very hard for people to kind of process that because think about that. Like how long would it take a person to grow their social account on YouTube to get to a million subs, which is an achievement in itself. And you're doing numbers like that a month, a month. And I'm yeah. looking at your YouTube channel right now. I'm going to brag on, on your behalf, okay? I'm looking at your videos. And sure if you thing. go to Jake's YouTube channel, uh, you're going to see his videos. If you sort them by numbers of viewed, your highest viewed video is a 19-second clip. It's 212 million <laughs> views. It's a short, I believe, right? Mm-hmm. Is all your yeah. content shorts right now? Yeah, I don't have any long form stuff on my YouTube channel. But short also in that they're vertically formatted under a minute long, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. So look at this. It's not an anomaly because he has multiple videos. I don't even know how far I have to scroll down that have millions or 100 million plus views. These are mm -hmm. staggering numbers. And do you mind me asking how old you are? Yeah, I just turned 24. Yeah. Last week. Yeah. <laughs> it hurts me a little bit. <laughs> I could be old enough to be your father. My my oldest son is only six years younger than you. So you are, yeah. by all accounts, completely crushing and living the dream. Do you mind if I just ask you some really kind of just business questions? Are you pretty transparent about what you do and how you do what you do and everything? Um, attached, I'm or? transparent about everything. But in terms of like specific figures, I haven't shared anything in terms of like what my actual revenue is. Okay. But I'm, I'm more than happy to speak generally about it. Little known fact is actually against YouTube terms of service to share revenue figures. Is that right? And so, and yeah. And so I have, I have like a team at YouTube and they've been like, well, you could, a lot of people do, but like on the back end, in my impression, it's a little bit frowned upon. So yeah, I haven't shared anything specifically, but I'm more than happy to talk about it generally. First of all, I just want to comment really quickly because I also got this thing, this very unexpected surprise from YouTube. And I saw that you posted on Instagram, your NFT. So let's talk about that a little bit. So they sent some creators, I don't know how many creators they sent it to, these intangible sculpts. And I yeah. see that you shared it on Instagram. Do you have a, a crypto wallet? No, I don't. I haven't even claimed it yet. But <laughs> like, it's weird because I I support crypto and like uh, Web3 and stuff. I'm like all following a bunch of people who like speak about it all the time. Mm -hmm. But I haven't like really gotten into it personally yet. It's a yeah. time constraint for myself, I like to think. But yeah. 
Well, you're not alone because uh, I haven't gotten into it either. I still have my my box here and I need to claim it. So I, my son, my 15 year old son has a crypto wallet already. And I don't. That's just letting you know how the world is working right now. Yeah. Okay. So I, I presume they, they've sent it to creators, I think, uh, who've been pretty active with shorts. I'm not going to make that assumption. I don't know because there wasn't a detailed note that said anything. But one, one thing I will say for, for, for me at least, and I want to know how you feel about this. I think YouTube is such a special and unique platform that they will assign uh, an advisor to to help you grow your channel and to give you support and to to make gestures like this to send you things and I, I mean what's your take on it what's your feeling towards uh, YouTube specifically as a social platform? Yeah, it's it's the absolute best. I sent a when I hit ten million this past or two weeks ago now, I sent an email to just like all my contacts or people who have like touched my career in unique ways that work at YouTube. And after I compiled the list, it was like an email list of 14 people. And I was like, how blessed am I to have connection to that many people who work at headquarters who are like actively trying to support me to be the best I can. It's incredible. And so it's like, as a as someone who's doing social media full time, of course, it's nice to have somebody to email and just say, oh, I have a question about how do I start up a secondary account? Or do I need to be branded in this way? Or, you know, it's nice to ask questions. But of course, like I do not expect to receive end of year gifts like that. And so yeah. it's like icing on the cake. I don't need that. But yeah, it is uh, certainly a special place. And it really makes me feel valued, you know, as yeah. a contributor. Same here. And I think there are many platforms that one can create on. We know that if you have the short form vertical format video, you can post it on TikTok. And you can also do Instagram Reels. But there's a special place in my heart for YouTube because of how they create or how they deal with and the relationships with creators. I think that's really, really unique. And I hope more platforms will do this and respect that. It, there's, it's a lot of work to actually to create content on a consistent basis. Now, for people who aren't familiar with the kind of shorts you create, can you describe it? Yeah. Um, so the layman's term for the software I use, I always say it's the same software that Disney and Pixar use. And that gives a little bit of context stylistically maybe to what I'm making. So it's like animated characters. And I really focus on doing pop culture and video games. And so I create, you know, it's stylistic as in it doesn't really look exactly like the games typically do. Um, so it has my own artistic take on it. But um, yeah, they're really snappy. Most of them are actually even under 20 seconds long. And, you know, lately I've been doing a lot of horror content, but in the past I've done like a lot of snappy comedy stuff, physical comedy sometimes, if that gives a little bit more context. But yeah, I don't know. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll try my best to add on top of that based on the things that I've seen. And please feel free to correct me if I don't have this right. Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, they look like holy CG environments that are bordering now sometimes photo real. There's very yeah. dramatic lighting in your horror series when I'm looking at it. And there's, there's this character which feels familiar yet unfamiliar. It, it's like this furry creature with really long, exaggerated limbs, a really happy looking smile until the creature opens its mouth. and It's got all these jagged teeth in it. So it's funny and scary at the same time. So you've got this weird... Uh, appeal, I think, where it's like, I want to be scared, but not so scared that uh, I'm, I'm worried about my life. So first question for you, is it all CG or is there some compositing done with live action? Oh, it's it's completely CG. Okay. I've, I've thought many times about getting like a Rococo motion capture suit to make things a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. But um, just with the way that I work, it just makes sense for me to keyframe everything. So everything is like manually done. Every arm movement is like keyframed, keyframed. and keyframed. Yeah. So yeah. uh, again, since this is kind of like an audio platform, I want to describe to you a little bit. So if you imagine like Monsters, Inc. And Sully is, I believe, the, is it Sully, the, the, the blue? Well, actually, before you go on this, yeah. the game that the most recent series that you're describing here is actually a video game. So oh, it's not it? of my own creation. Yeah. And so it's still along that franchise that I don't own. And the game is called Poppy Playtime. And so some people may recognize that name, but it's very niche. Okay. Very good. I'm glad you disclosed that because I'm not familiar with yeah. that. But yeah. it's just like this blue feathered furry creature, which mm. uh, if you know anything about computer rendering, hair and fur, it, it's pretty computationally intensive to do. And you're building these characters in 3D and they're rigged with skeletons and you're sitting there animating each and every part, uh, every primary, and secondary, and even tertiary animation, right? And you're dealing mm -hmm. with lighting, camera movements. So there's a lot of work. So on average, I think you said like you spend like a full day making a 15 second animation and it takes hours to render these things out is that right yeah exactly okay so when we're talking about building content this is like 
a full-time morning to night endeavor for you on a daily basis, right? Absolutely. Well, in this past couple months, I've actually mm-hmm. been doing like every other day because mm-hmm. doing a full video like this, even though it's, I always feel like a little pathetic when I say it out loud, but like making a 15 second video sometimes takes two or three full days of work. And I've kind of come off of the daily grind because I've made it to my milestones that I've been reaching for. And there was a while where I would just like get up at six and just like work for 12 hours and then set it to render and then sleep. And then when it's done rendering in the morning, do it all over again. And so now I'm kind of relaxed a little bit. I, not that I'm like a jaded old 3D modeler, but because I've only been doing this for a year, but yeah. I think with the success a little bit, I've been able to be like, okay, I can like eat lunch now, or like, yeah. you know, just chill out a little bit. But so I do even spend multiple days making some of these pretty much my, my practice is just get them out as fast as I can. And so mm. when you see two days in between, it's like, well, it's because I'm spending a lot of time on it. It's not because I'm uh, hanging out on the beach. Yeah. I want to talk to you a little bit more about the creative process. Uh, because mm-hmm. even every third day, think about it. He's making a 20 second fully animated 3D uh, film every single or every other third or fourth day. That is a lot. That pace is incredible. Forget about every day. Just even once a week is a lot. So take me through your creative process. How does an idea begin? And take me through the the major steps that you go through. Well, um, I'd say first up is like getting the right idea, right? And so, and everybody always asks me, that's like one of the main questions that I get quite frequently is like, how do you come up with your ideas? And my answer is like, honestly, I don't really know where they always come from. And sometimes there's like direct inspiration from other creators, right? So I follow a plethora of people who uh, who inspire me. And when I was doing the Minecraft stuff specifically, I did 100 part series on Minecraft. A lot of that is like following trends and saying, okay, what are the other Minecrafters doing right now? And with the horror stuff, um, there still are, a few people who do similar content online, but it certainly is um, difficult to come up with ideas regardless of what sort of uh, concept you're revolving it around. And so I'd say typically it, revo- it comes from a shower thought or sort of like my own experience in game. These are all mostly video game related content. So my own experience in game or something I've seen uh, someone else do, but there is really no straight answer. I go on a lot of walks. And so when I'm walking around, I'm thinking, I dedicate a lot of time to creative thinking. Like that's one of the biggest, well, not, no, it's not the, one of the biggest parts of my job, but I'd say on average, it takes me an hour to two hours a day of like just sitting down to kind of like close closing my eyes or having a cup of coffee and like only thinking about what am I going to make today. And so it's kind of weird when I'm just like sitting there with my eyes closed and I've been at home for the last week. So I'm like just sitting in the fire room like, mom, don't talk to me. I'm trying to think of an idea. But yeah, there's dedicated creative thinking time in my life. And and that's the biggest thing. And so sorry for going on a rant about that. But after there's the right idea, it's pretty much like you sketch out a storyboard, pretty typical creative process, sketch out a storyboard, know what my shots are going to be, know what the assets are going to be before I go into creating the actual thing. And then, you know, animating it, which is is like we already discussed, hand keyframes, and then there's the rendering process. And so, yeah, above and beyond everything else, it's like once you have the right idea, everything else kind of like is a mechanical process. Mm. Then it's production at that point, and you know what to yeah. do, right? Yeah, you have- and I have the office going on a second monitor. It's very like... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of just like you're in your flow state. Much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, do you have a large asset library of 3D set pieces, furniture, objects, or are you modeling a bunch of stuff as you as you need it? Um, one of the sweetest things about doing this as a full time job now is that I have a budget for buying stuff, mm-hmm. um, which saves so much time. Like yeah. if I was actually modeling every couch that went in the background or designing the buildings myself, it be easily adds an hour to two hours onto production to actually do all that stuff. Oftentimes when there's a unique character, I do a lot of the character design myself. And there are many times where the, the scenes can't be just simply bought. But a lot of it is kit bashed from Turbo Squid or CG Trader, those type of places. So I do have a quite a large and growing model set. Mm. Is that also like with a, a large and growing shader library so that you can quickly change the way things look? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I have an immaculate file system. Let's just say that. I learned early on that if things are not labeled in absolutely every single little subfolder, it adds so much more time to like try and where was that rock texture? And right. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, well, it's what my, my former creative director, Matthew Encino, would call digital hygiene. You're very clean in how you organize things because anybody that's a prolific content creator knows this already. If you haven't paid the price, you now know it that if you spend minutes every day looking for an asset that's minutes away from creative thinking, working, or, or doing nothing. And so that's that's a thing that we all learn uh, hopefully earlier in the part of our career. Uh, you mentioned something. Uh, you said you have a budget now to buy assets and produce things. Now, in the beginning, we talked about how you built a portfolio online to go and get work presumably to get a job at one of these design animation studios, right? Mm -hmm. And 
did you actually ever wind up doing freelance design work and animation work? Yeah, I did for a year and a half or so. Mm-hmm. I did just freelance stuff. That's like was my, my full time thing. Mm-hmm. You were doing this while you're still in school? Well, and to clarify that, building my portfolio, or as you mentioned, wasn't necessarily to get a job at a advertising agency. My goal was I, I enjoyed doing the freelance stuff. I like being my own boss. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't necessary to land a job. It was more like to land clients. Sort right. Of thing. So yeah. they're showcases for your skill set, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, so were you freelancing while still in school? Because I'm trying to get yeah, the timeline so, here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so basically, I started freelancing my the summer after my junior year in college. And then um, I had so much success with it. And I had clients that were like, well, we, we still have work for you regardless of whether you're not going into your senior year. And right. so I just continued working with people, sort of juggling my schoolwork and my clients, you know, at a balanced rate. Right. And then by the time I was ready to graduate, I already had several people who were like on my line, ready to go with work. And so I did that for, I, I want to say like eight months or so. I did mm-hmm. it for the whole year right and there was all that covid stuff going on too so it's like all my school went online so i was like equally spending time doing freelance and um school work to the point where i was like i was just ready to do full-time freelance by the time i graduated so right. yeah it wasn't like it wasn't super long but it was certainly i th- i would like to think that if i never did social media i would have survived as a freelance person yeah i think you would have so were you doing similar things were you doing modeling and animation or something different Yeah, it was similar in in the way that it was a one-man band. So I was Mm -hmm. doing all the modeling, texturing, animation, rendering. At that time, working completely for my MacBook, which like now it's like, I can't believe that I ever did any of that for my MacBook in the first place. But yeah, it was was one-man band all the way through, so. Okay, so for most people, they actually never break this kind of orbit. I get it. First, the traditional um, linear path is you're at school, you do a couple of freelance gigs, and then you finish school and then you do a lot of freelance work and you post some things on social, but that's the loop that people get stuck in uh, or that's the cycle that they are happiest in. I shouldn't say stuck. So you're trying to finish school and also doing freelance work, which to me is like trying to juggle one too many things. Did you feel uh, tired, stressed out, burnt out, trying to like finish school and also doing freelance work? And what compelled you to finish school when you were getting freelance work as, 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 a, as a student? I had my schedule lined up pretty well, whereas like my senior classes weren't the most difficult. And so I kind of had known for a while that, you know, my senior year wasn't going to be my hardest year. Yeah. And so with that and with everybody going online, I had two professors actually just say, OK, we're not doing finals online and the grade which you had the grade. And when COVID went online, they're like, we're done. So part of it's that. And I think I was so passionate about doing the work too, the freelance stuff that it never really bugged me too much, like spending a couple extra hours every day, like at my computer. And it's not like I was doing full time. It's not like I was a full time freelancer, right? There's balance there. And all my clients were well aware that I was a student too. So they're like, well, you know, cut him some slack if he has finals week. Mm -hmm. I I see that on your about page that uh, you studied marketing. Mm -hmm. And that seems quite different than what you're doing. Uh, so did you, is this something that you taught yourself to do? Yes, I'm, I'm completely self-taught in the 3D world. The story is actually kind of funny. At the end of my junior year, I was trying so hard to get a marketing internship. And for the longest time, I thought that I was going to be working at a clothing company. I like clothing a lot. And I feel like it. the way I always think about clothing is like it's branding for people. And so I think that working in the marketing section of a clothing company would be cool. And I had plenty of interviews with like, I actually went out to the Abercrombie headquarters to interview for stuff and like Tommy Hilfiger. And there was like all these brands that I really liked and I just kept getting rejected from them. And so anyway, by the end of my junior year, it's like, well, I have nothing going on this summer. I might as well do my, give it the old college try and sell some animations because this is something that I've been doing on the side just for fun for a while. And so what ended up happening that summer is that I landed actually one big client that ended up pushing me beyond my comfort level to the point where it's like, all of a sudden it's like, okay, I promised this deliverable and I need to like get this stuff out the door as professional quality. Um, And so I developed a lot of skills that summer that made me realize like, oh, I don't need to get a job at a marketing place or I don't need to go work for a clothing company. It's like, I have my own little business starting up here. Funnily enough, that's this is the time period when I discovered the future and all of your work, Chris, um, because it's like, I was all of a sudden looking for mentors and like, how do I sign a contract or what do I value my brand at? Like, is this worth a thousand dollars? Is this worth $10,000? Like, what do I price this stuff at? And so this is the time period when I was like, turn on to your stuff. And I like really listen to your podcast, like every single day during this time period, like just trying to learn about contracts and stuff. So, yeah. As as you're 
a freelance professional, now we have to learn about the business stuff and how to price our work, right? Yeah. So for that period in between you doing freelance work before you just went full-time content creator, there was that moment where you were working it out. Did you find uh, that you were able to overcome these challenges and these questions that you had? Yeah, but not without mistakes yeah. along the way. I think my first project that I sold for, I won't say who they are, but the first project that I sold for this one company, I sold it for $1,000 and it was like a one minute animation, 3D animation, mm -hmm. which is like drastically undersold myself. And it was like, took me a whole month to do. And so, <laughs> and then I turned around in the next month, I was like, yeah. all right, I need to figure out like how I can make this sustainable. On one side of the coin, it's like when they sold that, when they signed that contract, I was like, called my mom and dad and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm making a thousand dollars for my right. artwork. Right, you know? right. And then I was like, wait a second, that's actually not that good of a deal if I'm working on this for a whole month. And so I, then the same client came back to me and wanted more work. And I was like, well, it's going to be a lot more expensive. Yeah. And they were okay with it. So yeah, there was a lot of hiccups along the way though. Okay. Pa pause right there. I, I think everyone who's listening to this is probably has a smile on their faces. We've all been there. We're doing something we're not, I don't know if it's worth anything. And then we find a client who's willing to give us real money to do this work. And so you're going into it like, oh, I'd be happy with a thousand bucks because prior to that, it was zero. So a thousand mm -hmm. compared to zero was a lot. Did you estimate in your mind at that point it was going to take you a month to do or, or did you not even think about that? I didn't even think about it because here I was like, okay, well, I failed all of my internship applications. So it's right. like if I could make five dollars this, this year selling my artwork like that, would just be That'd fun. Be cool. I yeah. was even I just remember even debating behind the scenes like seven hundred fifty dollars or a thousand dollars. I don't know if they're going to sign. And I knew I did something <laughs> wrong when I sent them the email for a thousand dollars and they immediately like within five minutes sent it back signed. And I was like, OK, hey. that was a pretty quick. Like they didn't think about that. Right. They weren't consternating about well, should we or shouldn't we? Can we afford to do this because you're talking about a hundred dollars uh no not even let me try to figure this out like per second what is that a thousand oh, divided by 60 it's ridiculously low yeah, it is ridiculously yeah. low um okay so you learned a couple of things and then you're like wait a minute this is not going to work what did yeah. you come back at them with in terms of price and they're like yeah we could do that still um, then they, then they had a set of three more animations ranging from like 30 seconds to a minute. Mm -hmm. And I think we signed a $20,000 deal. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. Or maybe it was even 25. Um, but yeah, so it still was like not what I started charging later on yeah. after I'd been doing it for a, a long time. But I remember I even consulted, I had a friend who runs an advertising agency in my college town. I asked him about it. I was like, do you think that they're going to sign this? Or like, do you think I should just maybe bump it up to 1500 or what do you think? And he was like, yeah, you, they're definitely not going to sign it. And then I was like, well, if they don't sign it. Oh, I, there was a lot of back and forth, right? Yeah. And there was a couple of people that tell me that this isn't going to work, but they did. And I, I guess part of it too is like they liked what I made the first time around. So yeah. Yeah. I want to say this for the future Jake out there in the world that if you're talented and you're doing this, and you're not quite sure. Don't call your cousin. Don't call your friend in, in your town. Call me. I will tell you how much to charge. <laughs> I'll tell you the market rate and you can adjust based on that. Okay. Yeah. So this is a huge jump though. A thousand to 25,000 in your next gig. It tells me a lot of things. One, you're easy to work with. You delivered something of high quality because for them to, to agree to pay you, not quite 25X because we're talking about three different video projects here, but it's mm -hmm. a significant jump up. And that means you're probably still under market. But how did you feel then? Because if you're happy to call your mom and say, mom, I got a thousand bucks. And she's like, awesome. This is amazing. And it's not even what you're studying in school. So when you got 25,000 and they signed that, what was the feel like for you at that point? I was jumping around, but more than anything, it was that, like I already briefly mentioned earlier, it was an epiphany of like, oh, I definitely don't need to go work for a clothing company or whatever. Like, I love making art. I feel like I'm getting paid to just like play around on my computer. And so at that point, it's like, well, I'm going to do my absolute best at this and then see what we can do to sign the next contract with the same client, you know? And so it's like, let's keep the ball rolling. I was super excited about it. Awesome. So when you're a young person, and I think, what are you? Are you 23 at this point? 22? No, oh man, I was uh, just 21 maybe. Oh, this 21. Was, wow. This was, yeah, uh, I don't know. This was a few years back. I want to say this is after my junior year. It's 2019 maybe. Yeah, because okay. I'm getting messed up back. because you just graduated in 2020. Well, so I turned, yeah, so I just turned 24 last week and I've been out of school for two years. I don't know. Okay. It's so hard to do the math on it when right, it's right. like we'll COVID it has made everything make <laughs> feel like. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're saying. One of my friends tweeted, it's Blur's Day. Like we have no idea what day it is anymore. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're still in, in your early 20s yeah, and, yeah. and you got this gig for 25,000 bucks and you, you deliver it, everything, you get paid. What did you spend the money on? Tell me the first couple of things you bought for yourself with this money in your pocket. I didn't, I didn't buy anything at all. Really? 
nothing, not a single thing. I didn't buy a new watch or a new pair of shoes. New monitor, new computer, uh, new video card? Nothing. Really? I did not oh. buy a single thing huh. um, because I was like, now all of a sudden it became my stipend because when I decided like, okay, this is going to be my thing. This yeah. is like my lifeblood that's going to allow me to not get a job at a mm. marketing thing. So I was like, this is when I have to make pay my rent next when I graduate. So I didn't, yeah. at that point too, you don't know, is this a fluke? Like, did I get over my head? Am I going to be able to deliver on this stuff? And like, is anybody ever going to pay me $25,000 again? So right. for me, all of a sudden it became like, okay, this is the most important thing for me is to just like save this and eat ramen noodles for mm. the first like three months after I graduate because I don't know where it's going. So I didn't buy anything. And I think sometime in the winter after I had been doing a couple more freelance jobs, I bought a new MacBook, um, but it wasn't insanely in expensive or anything like that. But it was like, okay, this is a tool for my business to like be able to. Right. But I was still really bare bones on everything in, in terms of like my things I use for work. Like I didn't mm -hmm. buy even like a new mouse or anything. I was like, this is working for me now. I'm going to keep it as low key as possible. So you know, you're a very mature young man because you're looking at this as long term. You you made some money. You're like, this needs to last me from now until when I make my next gig and there's no predictability. And I love that you're so disciplined. Where does this discipline come from? Um, I really, I've gotten this question before too, actually. And I, I really think that it comes from listening to guys like yourself, um, Gary Vaynerchuk too. I feel like he's a very polarizing guy, but I'm sure people who listen to the future, there's probably some crossover there and just kind of absorbing the aura of, you know, people who are in the space doing well. And I couldn't necessarily point to a specific thing, but if there's anything, it's like having some people that you look up to that just like are pointing you in the right direction. So. Yeah. So if people are listening to this. I just want to be clear about a couple of different things. I think the thing you're referring to about Gary is like, he's like, you know what? Move back in with your parents. Don't spend any money. Be smart yeah. about this money and and don't be, uh, don't fall in the trap of what many professional athletes and hip hop artists do, which is they make some money and they spend it all. And then five years after they had their moment time in the sun, they're dead broke, each and every single mm -hmm. one of them. Because they go out and buy jewelry, they buy cars, they buy things they can't afford. They, they pay for their entourage. It's a foolish way to spend your money. Okay, so mm -hmm. you're doing really well. Now, at some point, your your videos start taking off. And I'm going to make this assumption that you're, you're because of the numbers that you're posting, even though they're shorts, because shorts don't earn as much money as medium to long form content, that now you're also drawing revenue from YouTube AdSense. Is that right? It's a very, very small amount. Mm, okay. It's practically negligible. And unless you're at the very top, like I'm at the, I would say I'm among like the top five or 10 short form creators on the platform. Mm -hmm. um, unless you are in the very, very tippy top, it's like you can't count on making any money from that. Okay. This is good to know yeah. for everybody listening. So you can post yeah. huge numbers for shorts, but shorts, you're not getting a lot of AdSense revenue from that. And that we're seeing the same thing. So yeah. then this begs the next question, then where are you drawing your money from? Um, the short answer is I'm not. I don't make a ton of money, um, to be frank. Okay. But there is the the uh, YouTube Shorts Fund, which was recently released. I think it's been running now for four months or so, five yep. months maybe, which has a cap of $10,000 a month, which I have not met that cap yet, mm -hmm. um, which again, it's like pulling 200 million views a week and not meeting that cap is sort of a right. surprise to a lot of people. So I'm certain there are a few people who are meeting that, or I shouldn't say certain, but I'd like to think there are a couple of people like Lanky Box, if you're familiar with them, they they do a lot of short form stuff. And mm -hmm. there's this other guy named Dan Rhodes um, who pulled even double what I'm doing. So yeah, I think there probably are people th that make that money, but frankly, I don't make a ton. And as far as I'm concerned, as long as my rent and my food is paid for, uh, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. And my sort of attitude towards it has been like, just keep the machine running. And there's going to be a time in my career, I have no doubt that I'm going to be rich one day, but I feel like right now I'm not doing any sort of cash grab for that reason. I've done a couple of brand deals, which also pay the bills nicely. And TikTok also has a creator fund. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. This is really good to know and it's very refreshing. So, even though you're posting ginormous numbers, and d depending on which blog you read, you're one of the fastest growing content creators on YouTube mm -hmm. and only to be rivaled by your following on TikTok. So, mm -hmm. I, I want to talk to you about a couple of different things. I'm a content creator, I'm, I'm speaking for our audience, and I can choose to create a short form vertical piece of content for Instagram for YouTube or TikTok? If I had to pick one, which one would you say for me to work on and concentrate on? Well, it's just, it's not a question because you don't have to pick. And so if you're asking my opinion of which I like the most, I think there's probably more opportunity on YouTube for like having the breakout success that I have had. But it's such a silly question. Like there's no circumstance which you are you should ever put forth effort in making a short form vertical video and not have it on every single platform. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this. A lot of people call that syndication or content repurposing. 
Uh, so if you are able to make one piece of content that works with the guidelines for, for multiple platforms, there is really no reason for you to not do this, right? To, to repurpose your content and post on multiple places. Now, I understand that Reels does not like it when the TikTok logo is burned into your clip. They, they will probably push that down an algorithm. But since you're creating all this content in an original format, as long as it's under, I think, 60 seconds, as long as you use the proper hashtags and you can post it on any of your platform, you will build your audience. The reason why I asked that question, though, because I noticed there's a huge discrepancy between your followers on Instagram to YouTube and then TikTok. 11 million on TikTok, 10 million on YouTube, and a little over 100,000 on Instagram. Theoretically, and you have to tell me, using the exact same content, what do you think the, the, the issue or the challenge is? Um, so all of my content got it's got it got its kickoff when Among Us was really big, which is a multiplayer game. And this was really a, a big hit in late 2020. And at that time, I wasn't committed to doing social media full time. And so my Instagram was actually still like very personal at that point in time, too. Mm-hmm. And I didn't uh, start posting my artwork on Instagram until uh, last February. So it missed the initial kickoff point that my other channels had, because literally both of my channels got their start at the same time with the same content, notably with different audiences. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'll I'll circle back to that in a moment. But I like to think that the uh, one of the main reasons why my Instagram didn't take off is because it didn't get started with the same content. And at that time, too, I saw a lot of my videos going viral on other people's stuff. Um, My Among Us stuff, when that was popping off, still to this day, it has my most views on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um, But that was really like the kickstart of my stuff. Um, So I'd like maybe that's it. But it's just hard to say. I think that it's really difficult to push your followers from one place to another. The best way to grow a following is to do it organically on the platform platform itself. And so it's taking a little bit more time, but I think that it'll eventually catch up. Okay. So I have a question for you because I'm still relatively new to TikTok and you're right. Like we, we tend to create content somewhere and we get familiar with the platform, how it wants us to label, to add tags or titles a certain way. And each platform is a little bit different. And so you have to kind of switch gears. So I'm noticing wild swings from one platform to the next. Something on Instagram will grow really fast in the first couple of days and then it'll taper off and that's it. And and YouTube might take days or weeks for it to then find its audience and then it spikes. And one of the reasons why I love YouTube so much is because it's not so ephemeral. There's this evergreen quality to it that if it's a good piece of content, if you title it appropriately, that an audience will eventually find it. And you can pick this weird second win, third win, and then you can just take off like a rocket ship. So what have you learned in posting this, repurposing the same piece of content on multiple platforms. What does each platform want you to do? If you have any insight there, that would be really helpful. Um, I think that a lot of people get caught up in the idea that they're very different. And this is a personal opinion, right? Mm-hmm. But I think that at their heart, they're all very similar in that they're just trying to connect the people on the other side of the screen to a video that they want to watch. And so they do it through the algorithms that they all have. And the you know they all have their own little life cycle, which we could certainly debate about. Like you said, YouTube has a much longer tail than other platforms. But I think at their heart, like your goal shouldn't be like, okay, do I need to have a different title on my TikTok versus on my YouTube caption or whatever. I think the the heart of it needs to be like, how do I make just the best less than 60 second video that I can and Mm -hmm. trust that the platform is going to do its best with its own algorithm to find that audience. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of optimization and stuff among the platforms, like they work differently sometimes, but they really are trying to do the same thing. Right. Well, see, the reason why I asked that question, because I'm I'm in a more nuanced place where I I create all kinds of different kind of content because I I try and write guides to help people through this process. As far as I can tell with YouTube, it's your title and your thumbnail. And I don't even bother with, with hashtags or meta tags, anything like that, except for shorts. You have to have the word shorts in as a hashtag for it to work. And then Instagram, people are saying, you know, it's like six to 10 hashtags. And then, so I got a little bit more work to do. And then I'm adding captions, which I don't do for YouTube. It's kind of weird, like what each one wants. And I really believe in this and that, even though it's the same piece of content, you still have to post it in a native way and speak in the native language of that platform because you're training that algorithm to understand and recognize this piece of content. And yeah. I think your shorts work really well because uh, there's no dialogue as far as I can tell. It's it's a cool visual. You're you're tapping into different trends, so you're being powered by a trend uh, and also the the kind of interesting stories and the sometimes funny dark comedy that you're able to do. And so it has this kind of much broader universal appeal that has a much higher chance of going viral than saying talking about here's how you price a project which is a very narrow audience so i have to understand and work the algorithm a little bit more and understand what each platform wants 
Yeah. yeah. And so like, like you said, I'm, I'm treated to a little bit of a different, well, yeah, I get pampered a little bit because my stuff is not that niche for the most part. And I haven't had to work that hard to distinguish how I'm posting each video. I really just right. slap them up on each thing and that has worked for me. And mm -hmm. other people may have to work a little bit harder than it. So yeah. perhaps I'm not the best person to give advice on that. <laughs> <laughs> but I love your answer. Your answer is still yeah. super awesome because you're like, and I believe in this. If you make content so good, you don't have to worry about what the algorithm is doing at all. And it, I think that's your philosophy. I will spend, I'm speaking on your behalf here, like I will spend 8, 10, 12, 14, 24 hours working on something to make one piece of content. And that effort shows up in the way that you're rewarded with the audience that you're able to build, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. You said something, and I want to circle back to this, which is you said, I'm confident I'll be rich. I'm not worried about it right now. Yeah. Okay. So I love that confidence. What does being rich mean to you? It's funny because I'm I'm not a collector of cars. I don't have a nice apartment and I don't really necessarily have aspirations to own like a iced out Rolex. For me, rich, rich is like being able to travel without worrying about um, my work. And so there's a whole plethora of things that would have to happen along the lines for that to happen. Um, but also in a lot of ways, like I feel like I'm rich already with my following online is like a, it's a wealth in and of itself. And so, yeah, it's not always necessarily monetary payoff that I'm looking for. And yeah, maybe that's why I haven't been driven by money in the first place. Mm -hmm. So is being rich just um, you having freedom? Yeah. Yeah. I would say yeah. that's a, that's probably a really shortcut to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think somebody else I read online said something like being rich or being wealthy. I think that's the word they use. Being wealthy means being able to do what you want with who you want, whenever you want. And we all have different definitions of that because you're not, you are saying I'm not a materialistic person per se. I don't need to floss and flex how much money I have. So that means your threshold for being wealthy or rich is much lower and you can, you can go for much longer because you're not spending that money in ways that don't really mean something to you, right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I was just going to add a little interesting thing to that. When I committed to doing social media full time, I had made like a total of $100 from my TikTok and no money from YouTube at all. And so I committed to it knowing that the money I'd saved up from my freelance stuff was enough to last me like eight months or whatever, eight months, maybe a year. And so I was like, all right, if I really put my head down and work at this, like I believe that it's going to bring some money in. But even at that point, I was like paired to just eat ramen and like live in an apartment that had rats in it and stuff. Um, so it's like, I'm seriously like... I'm I'm not living <laughs> high and mighty. I think it's funny because I think a lot of people who have 10 million subscribers um, who are benefiting from AdSense are sitting pretty in a in a mansion in Beverly Hills. Right. And so it is different to be a shorts creator too, but also I don't really necessarily have aspirations to just spend a bunch of money. Yeah. Okay. I hate to do this because it, it feels like you're, you're not a guy who's motivated by money, but I have to ask you the business question because I don't get that uh, many opportunities to sit in front of somebody who's just very recently hit huge milestones on multiple platforms. I'm just curious, comparatively speaking, not necessarily the number, but from the, the creator fund from YouTube to TikTok, are, are they about the same or is one uh, overperforming the other for the same kind of content? Um, YouTube pays, I'd say if I was going to like give you percentages, I'd yeah, say percent. 60 or 70% comes from YouTube. Yeah, actually probably 70%. TikTok pays me a fraction. It's funny because um, we mentioned this briefly earlier, like people often share screenshots of their earnings and stuff. And I look at this stuff and I'm like, how is this person making so much money? And even on TikTok too, like I feel like I'm making a fraction of what other people are making and I'm not sure what the deal is with that. Maybe it has to do with the frequency of my posting or the number of views I'm getting. But, you know, in terms of in terms of where my revenue is really coming from, mostly from YouTube. Okay, that's good to know. That's very good to know. Thank you yeah. for, for sharing that. Okay, I'm curious... With everything, you're a passionate human being, you're a designer, an artist, and you make stuff because it gives you joy to do. And then an audience emerges, and then you have some level of notoriety and fame. How has that been for you? Because I, I heard you on Clubhouse. I'm like, who's this young man talking right now, right? And, and, and people are saying, we want to interview you for this or that. How's that been like for you? Um, you know, I really haven't had that many run-ins with quote unquote fame. I'm in a pretty unique position where people don't really know my face. Right. Um, and so it's like, I've never been recognized. And it's also, I'm not getting DMs about like, oh, you're so cute or, um, you know, I'm not I get getting those all the time. Like Just kidding yeah. everybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, but it's, I mean, when people think about fame, I think that's really what they're really thinking about. And so it's like, I always like to say I'm not famous. My artwork is famous because as a person, people don't necessarily care about Jake Feldman quite yet. And it's on the agenda eventually. But, you know, at this point, people who care about Minecraft or Among Us or Poppy Playtime, they like me because of my artwork. 
And so, yeah, I haven't had that many run-ins with it. It's cool to, it's cool for people to want to hear me speak. That's yeah. pretty cool. And like this, uh, you and I sitting here right now, it's like, yeah, it's dream come true. It's like, I used to listen to your podcast quite a bit. And so, yeah, there are a few opportunities here and there that have like made me feel like, oh, this is like a small degree of famous, but I wouldn't necessarily call myself famous. Mm. Okay, good. I would love for you to kind of reflect because you're still in this place where you're close enough in age to my, my two sons. I have an 18 year old and a 15 year old. If you were to to talk to someone who wants to be where you're at today, where you're an independent creator, an artist, and you, you're self-sustaining, and you're able to do the things that you love and not have to worry about working for the man, what kind of advice would you give? Because my son is into video games. He's into making art and, and paintings and drawings, but he hasn't found his groove yet. Like, What kind of advice would you give to him? The number one piece of advice that I give to people who are trying to do their own thing or to make social media a full-time job I think it applies across a lot of things is to number one, find self-directed projects. Like before I had any freelance clients, I made a commercial for Rolex. Like if Rolex hired me, like this is what I would animate for them. If Nike, I made another one for Nike. Right. And so I made a couple different things on my own. Right. It's very self-directed. Nobody is going to tell me like, Jake, you need to build a portfolio of things. Looking back at them, they're so bad. Right. And that's where the second part comes in is like, you need to be being a perfectionist is going to be your downfall if you're trying to turn your passion or whatever it is into a social media thing or a full-time freelance thing. Um, because the thing is about making good artwork, and this is, again, personal opinions, right? Um, you can't make good artwork or you can't make a good social media video until you've made a lot of bad social media videos. Because through the process of making a lot of bad content or not necessarily even bad, just stuff even at the time, you can be proud of it. But through the process of making a lot, you're going to learn about how to make or what is good or what are the redeeming qualities of the bad videos that you've made along the way. And so, yeah, it's like I don't I don't necessarily have advice for how do you find your groove. But if there's something that interests you, certainly follow that path and don't be afraid to put things out into the world that you may look back on even six months from now and say, oh, it's kind of like a cringy video or maybe I should take that down. That's okay. all I have. <laughs> all right, great. I just want to make sure you weren't looking for the yeah. next thought there. Okay. I have a question to ask of you in that if someone is sitting there and thinking, I need to make a really high quality video, because at one hand, you're saying, spend the time to make a really great piece of content so you don't have to worry about the algorithm. And I'm also hearing you say that you have to get through a lot of qu quantity before you get to the quality. Yeah. How does one reconcile that? Because so many people, and I'm sure you know this too, in the creative space, they never make anything because they're like, I need to make my thing, my PS de resistance, you know, this is it. My whole meaning of my life has to go into this first piece. And they don't make anything. How do you help yeah. them to reconcile these two opposing ideas where make a really great piece of content, but in order to get there, you have to make a lot of crappy stuff sometimes that you might not be super proud of later. It's tough because it's also one of those things where it's like, do as I say, not as I do, because I'm sitting here at the upper echelon of the amount of time and effort that you can put into a 15 second video, right? Right. But I didn't start out making animations like this. And if you scroll to the very first TikTok thought that I made, it's something, it's a screen recording that took me less than 15 minutes to make. And the first 50 or 100 videos that are on my page are these very quick, snappy screen recordings. And they're really low production. And this wasn't even my very first TikTok account. I had two TikTok accounts before the one that took off, where I tried different formats, different content styles. I showed my face on one of them. And so it's like, you don't necessarily always see, when you see someone successful, you see what they're doing that makes them successful. And oftentimes it's something that has a very high quality output. But like if the average 3D artist came to TikTok and said, I'm going to make an animation like Jake Feldman does, and it's going to go viral. Odds are it's not going to go viral because you haven't made, I've made 300 animations now. And I have that leg up on like, this part needs to be five milliseconds shorter. And it's like, I have the innate ability to know what is good and what is bad about a viral piece of video because I've done it so many times. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's hard. It's hard when you're at the beginning to know that like, like you just have to get something out the door. But that's the reality of it for people who are already in the successful positions. They have put a lot of stuff out the door that isn't high quality. Okay, very good. I think what you're saying echoes so many different things we've said in the past, which is it's like the iceberg thing. You just see the tip, the success, and you don't see all the ugly, weird, bad things that somebody has to go through. And you put in the time on the mat or on the road so that you've learned and little tweaks. You've uh, gone through so many iterations that now you can do them fairly intuitively. You kind of know what works and what doesn't. And that comes through thousands of hours of practice and you, you put in that time. Wonderful. I have to ask you a couple other questions before I get out of here. One is, are there days, because I'm astonished too that you've made 
300 shorts because I used to work in animation and production and I know what it takes to do something like that at the level of what you're doing. So do you have days when you're like, you know what, I'm just not super amped up today. And if you do, what do you tell yourself? How do you feel? What, how do you process that? I have those days quite frequently and I do it anyway. I do the work anyway. And so that, that's not necessarily good advice for the average creative person. Like some people, it makes more sense for them to take the day off. Um, but for me, it's like, I'd rather have a video that I'm concept that I'm not necessarily passionate about or a video that I'm not necessarily proud of. I'd rather have it posted and up out the door than to spend an extra day wallowing and like, I don't feel like animating today. And so that's a personal thing. I don't know if it's necessarily healthy all the time, but I do the work regardless of whether I want to or not. And there are plenty of days where I don't want to do the work, but I think that I know how much of a blessing my career is. And I overall really enjoy a lot of things about what I do that make it worthwhile. I think it was Seth Godin who said something to the effect where the difference between a professional and amateur is a professional shows up even when they don't feel like showing up, right? Mm -hmm. That it's not on the, your creative whims if you're so inspired, you just do the work and eventually you'll get through the funk and then you'll do the work that you, you, you feel passionate and strongly about and that hopefully will inspire other people. Um, um, one other thing I'll add on to that is mm -hmm. there's plenty of videos that I have like halfway through production almost scrapped and been like, this is just a bad idea. I just want to go uh, grab a beer with a friend or something. I don't feel like doing this. And there has been plenty that I've been very close to just like scrapping the entire file. And it's like, we'll start over tomorrow with a new idea. And then right. I power through and it gets a hundred million views. And it's like, okay, that mm -hmm. was definitely worth it. And you do that a couple times and you realize like, it doesn't matter if I think it's good throughout the process. It more than anything, it matters that it's posted and it's up. And so although it, all my stuff looks pretty polished, it still has that same mindset, this scrappy mentality of like, I'm going to get it out the door, whether or not it's something that I'm super passionate about in the moment. What do you attribute to that kind of idea that that mindset that I'm not loving it? It's been a painful process, but I'm going to check myself and I'm going to finish it and I'm going to get it out there. And that that is its own reward, just finishing the project. Where does this come from? I think it comes from what I briefly said a minute ago is just that once you get it out the door and it gets 100 million views and you have that antidote to remind yourself of, okay, this is when I, w I was very close mm -hmm. to throwing out the door. And you see, okay, even the bad days can turn out to be good days once they're up. But that sounds to me like a chicken and egg problem. Yeah. You have the evidence that you pushed through and persevered. And so you're rewarded with the result. And so the next time you're like, hey, remember last time it worked? You would do that. But there's a lot of people out there who are going to be listening to this. Like they actually never went through. They didn't push through the pain. They quit. They dropped the project. They started something else. And then they stopped that and they started something else. Seth Godin describes this in his book, The Dip, where there's this valley where the amount of effort and the results that you're getting are upside down, where you're putting a lot of effort and not getting a lot of results. So most people just quit. They quit before it gets good. You have consistently gone through the dip emerge on the other side so you have all the positive reinforcements and affirmations that you're able to get. What can you well, tell someone who's stuck in that dip who quits and changes their mind again? I don't necessarily have advice, but I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. For a long time, I wanted it so bad. Like I really, really want this. And like I said, when I committed to doing social media full time, I wasn't making any money at it and I and I wanted it. And there's two things I keep taped to my monitor. One of them is a little quote that says, someone else wants it more. And it's this constant reminder to me. It's like, if I don't want it, there's somebody else who's going to go out and take it, whatever it is. And for me, it is success on social media, freedom, like we talked about, monetary gains down the road. But but without that grit, for me, frankly, it's a, it's grit. Like you have to put your head down whether you like it or not. And so, yeah, it's not necessarily good advice or like it's brighter on the other side because sometimes it isn't brighter on the other side. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but what I'm saying is like, I really wanted it. And that's what's put me through the, I think my big dip was like, okay, how do I turn this into a full-time thing? And the other thing is that I keep on my monitor. And I don't know if this is necessarily relevant, but I have another thing that says, are you capable? And when I feel like not doing something, I look at that and it's like, just read it. And then it's like, well, I am. Am capable of doing this today. And it's not a matter of like, do I feel like doing it? It's like, can I do it? And if the answer is yes, and if there's enough hours left in the day, I sit my butt down and keep working. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's not necessarily good advice. And perhaps you want to add on to that for something for the future listeners here, but my advice is grit. Yeah. That's what I have to share about it. Yeah. Grit and perseverance and just trusting the process and not probably allowing yourself to excuse yourself. The, mm -hmm. are you capable? Says, well, I have time. I can move my hand and there's still like oxygen in my lungs. So really the only reason why I don't want to do this is it's emotional. Otherwise yeah. you are able to do this. I, I love that. That's awesome. Okay. Here's the, the last hard question for you. I think you're 24 years old. 
having all kinds of success with content creation and a massive following. I think you're unique and special in, in many different ways and in any which way you want to interpret that. But a lot of people can slog at this for a decade and not get to that number. And so they're going to say, well, you're an anomaly. You, you're lucky and all that kind of stuff. And they're a little bit older. How can we help people who, who may feel like maybe that moment has passed them up? Um, I'll say this, that on YouTube specifically, some of the biggest creators in the short form game have not entered the space. Charlie D'Amelio, Little Huddy, the whole Hype House crew, among a plethora of other, have not posted a single short. These are people who have upwards of 50, 100 million followers on TikTok, right? Who are killing the short form game, who have not even posted a single YouTube short, right? And so the space is actually really, really new still. It's growing up, but the opportunity certainly has not passed. And I have no plans of doing anything different on YouTube this following year. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity for people to jump in this space now and have the same exact story that I had starting it tomorrow throughout the next 15 months. I really do believe that. It's not a mature format yet on YouTube specifically. And if you're making it for YouTube, might as well post it on TikTok. And I really do believe that the opportunity is all still right at the front door. Yeah. A lot of times what we don't recognize is opportunity when it's knocking at the door. We don't open that door. And you're saying what, and I also believe this, that it's not oversaturated yet. Uh, there's some shocking statistics about how many videos are uploaded to YouTube on a daily basis. It's astronomical in terms of minutes and hours of content created. But a very small percentage of that, those hours and billions of hours, I don't know how many hours of content is created on a daily basis, but a very small percentage is actually short content. And so there's a, there's an opportunity here. Jake, you're, you're experiencing, we've experienced massive growth on our channel, not compared to you, but compared to our old self, in that it feels like there's a gold rush here and there's just, you're tripping over bricks of gold. And you're like, guys, it's right here. All you have to do is do it and stick to it and get over yourself and be consistent and every day do a little bit better than the day before. And eventually the 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 platform might reward you, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly what I'm saying. It's still there. Yeah. Do you get a special plaque after hitting the 10 million views or subscribers? Uh, yeah, there's like a, I, I'm pretty sure it's the last award that YouTube gives out. It's like a diamond play button thing. It's not really diamond though. It's like Chrome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, be a very valuable plaque that you get. Yeah. Yeah. Do you well, did you already get yours? Uh, you have to order it, and yeah. I I'm moving next week, and so I haven't ordered it quite yet. All right. Well, yeah. I'm I can't wait uh, for us to get there. We have many years of work ahead for us to get to that 10 million mark. But what a wonderful accomplishment that you've had. And I I would say this. I mean, I think whatever conditions in which you grew up, the town you lived in, the parents, the culture, the society, they did a good job. They did a good job in you, young man. You got your head on straight. Uh, and I, I love that you're a success story. What I like to do is collect success stories of creative people who have gone on to become their own independent person without the need for clients. And you figured out the balance between revenue versus expenses. And as long as you manage those two things, you can live this way forever and do whatever you want from wherever you want. And and do it whenever you want. And so congratulations. Yeah, thanks, man. It means okay. a lot coming from you. Yeah. Well, what is next for you? Any Anything that we can get excited about? Or are you just going to plug away for another year and just see what happens? Um, one of my big goals for 2022 is to hire additional animators and start taking a step back into a creative director position and um, stop spending 10 hours, 12 hours a day in front of the computer. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's necessarily outwardly anything that you'd notice on my channel, but certainly something I'm trying to get done this year. Love it. So you're going to scale the team. You're going to have a couple of additional creators helping you. Maybe you'll take on bigger projects. Maybe, there, maybe things will get more complicated or you can have a specialist doing dynamics and particles or other things so that you can tell the story the way that you see it in your mind. I love that. Yeah. Look at you. All right. Trailblazing here. Uh, Jake, thank you very much for doing this uh, podcast with me. Appreciate it. Yeah. No, such an honor. If people want to find out more about you, wh where's the best place they can go? I have a website. It's jakefellman.com. And so all my contact information is on there. Yeah, jakefellman.com. You'll find all my contact information there. Wonderful. My name is Jake Fellman. You're listening to The Future.